Hello, I'm Mildred Solomon. I'm a professor here in the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School, where I have the privilege of directing the Center's Fellowship in Bioethics. I'm also the president of the Hastings Center, which is an independent research institute in Garrison, New York. The fellowship program here at Harvard Medical School is 25 years old. It was founded by Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel and Dr. Robert Trug. Bob Trug is now the director of the center where the fellowship is based. Our purpose is to build the bioethics capacity of the Harvard-affiliated teaching hospitals, but we also um, encourage participation and accept fellows from a wide array of medical schools and, uh, and hospitals from around the world. And I'm delighted that um, we also often encourage people to come to us from uh, very distant places. And today I have the privilege of chatting with a fellow in our 2016-2017 cohort, Dr. Abdullah Aljudi, um, who is a family medicine and community medicine physician from Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Dr. Aljudi. Thank, Thank you so much for talking Thank with you me. Thank you, for having me. Dr. Aljudi chairs the Ethics Committee. Um, is head of the research unit and is assistant director of academic affairs at King Fahd Hospital of the University in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you received your medical degree from King Faisal University and I understand that you also hold a diploma in epidemiology from King Saud University and as I said a board certificate in community medicine. You've published in peer-reviewed journals, including The Lancet, and I understand that you are uh, contributing to a publication that all of us are really looking forward to, a new publication, The Encyclopedia of Islamic Bioethics. And that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today. I thought you could share perspectives with us about what it's been like being a Muslim physician in our secular bioethics program in the fellowship here at Harvard. So I thought I'd, I'd sort of with through that lens ask you some questions about your year here. Well that's a big question. Yeah it's big. I'll try to break it down a little yeah, bit. Right. I mean let's start actually back in Saudi Arabia. Tell me what first interested you in bioethics to begin with. Well the first uh, uh, encounter with bioethical issue was in my internship year when I was uh, rotating in the Department of Neurosurgery. I was um, instructed by my resident to examine a patient in the ICU who is suspected to be a, de a brain death case. I went to the ICU as an intern and uh, I, found my, I found myself standing in front of the patient ha having no clue what to do mm -hmm. and uh, in the middle of my uh, thinking the nurse shouted, the head nurse shouted, said, are you going to examine the patient or just call your senior? So I just, I called my senior, and uh, I was thinking of that case. What does brain death mean? What are the criteria used? How can we sh mm -hmm. be sure or not sure about mm -hmm. the death? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the role of uh, Muslim scholars in deciding the criteria? But after the internship, I was actually uh, 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 deviated from that uh, uh, field. I went to epidemiology uh -huh. and public health. And then uh, I came back to the field in 2009 when I joined for the first time in my life the ethics committee uh, in one of the hospitals in the eastern province where I'm living. And uh, I got experience and got motivated. And then I moved to my university and uh, established the ethics committee ah. in the hospital and learned a lot uh, from the books I read and the lectures I heard and eventually I sought uh, a continuous medical education opportunity and attended the Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics course on bioethics in Switzerland. Oh, oh I didn't know that. Yes. So that's the beginning of the connection. Yes, that's the beginning. So uh, I enjoyed the course and I decided to continue learning from Harvard and here I am. So we're lucky enough to have you in our fellowship program this um, year and you bring so many perspectives that we wouldn't otherwise have represented so I've been really enjoying having you be part of our group. Thank you ma'am. I have learned a lot. I'm looking forward to learn more. Can you, this maybe isn't fair, it's, it is a big question and I can narrow it down but do you have observations about the relationship between 
Islamic bioethics and the secular kind of program and the secular training that you're experiencing this year? Well, actually, there are similarities, and of course, there are differences. But let's start with the similarities. Uh, the bioethics field is a multidisciplinary field, interprofessional Absolutely. field, yeah. where people come from different uh, profession with different perspectives in a forum to discuss the cases raised in, in the forum. So for example, in bioethics, you have philosophers, you have physicians, you have uh, public representatives, community members, you have lawyers. They come together and discuss these cases. It is similar in the Islamic bioethics with the addition of the Muslim scholars, the jurists, mm -hmm. the theologians, etc. So it's a multidisciplinary interprofessional. Another uh, similarity is that human being is in the center of the attention and uh, it is very valued. Uh, the human being is very valued in the, in the, in the field of bioethics. This is another similarity. A third similarity is that in bioethics, in the secular bioethics, there is no authority. In, in discussing the cases. It's like in Islam, there is no authority. So there are lots of s scholars and jurists discussing the cases and coming up with different interpretations. Oh. But the main difference is that in Islamic bioethics, it has a divine reference. So God is uh, uh, well established in the Islamic bioethics, while in the secular bioethics, Basically, there is no place for God. So that is the major, the main difference. And that is uh, in the epistemological uh, uh, level. Mm -hmm. But when, it, when we come to the applications, uh, it's very interesting to see the similarities between different rules. OK, well, then let it, let's go to some of the applications and get, and get more specific. As we've talked many times in the fellowship, there's a great emphasis on individual decision making in Western bioethics. And I'm wondering how that plays out in um, Muslim bioethics, and in particular, how it may play out in making decisions about the use of life sustaining technologies near the end of life. Well, uh, there was a study conducted in the United States about uh, families, Muslims, who are facing their uh, end of life decision. And they found that uh, Muslims who were born in USA and raised in USA, they are more prone to ask for, this, uh, for their, uh, to respect their autonomy in comparison to those who were, were born and raised outside USA, but they, uh, uh, they came to the USA after that. They still have the family bond, and they believe that families should be part of their decisions. So the more... Uh assimilated so or longer people that were here longer yes see it more as the patient's decision rather than the family's decision yes that's that's the difference both of them all of them are Americans living in America but those who lived in um, who were born and raised in America they believe on the autonomy more than those who were raised born and raised outside America but because of the family is very central in Islamic bioethics in the Muslim community. Family is very essential, and the family could be involved in the decision sometimes if the decision uh, is like, for example, the end-of-life care. But according to the guidance of the Muslim scholars, according to the uh, resources in Islamic bioethics. So patients who can speak for themselves have the right to refuse treatment. And if somebody's unconscious, let's say, and being supported on a ventilator, un they're not going to be recovering consciousness. Are you, you're saying in Saudi Arabia, families could make the decision, or would doctors make that decision? How does that, how would that work? Well, in this case, if the patient is unconscious and there is a diagnosis by a, a committee of physicians, three physicians at least, deciding that the intervention is futile and useless and there is no hope, then they will discuss the case with the family. If there is any uh, indication of the patient's preference or patient decision, it will be taken. But in addition to that, family has very influential role in deciding of stopping the, the, the treatment. And this, there is a landmark fatwa. We call it fatwa. It's a, a, it's a religious ruling by the 
committee form of religious mm -hmm. uh, uh, scholars in addition to physicians. And they came up with the fatwa that if the three physicians or the committee decided that the patient uh, cannot come back, then they have the right to stop the, the ventilators and to, live, to let the death process take its natural course. And if families object, do families object? Well, is, yes, is, sometimes, uh, sometimes families uh, object. And in this case, they have the right to uh, transfer the patient or they have the right also, or they have the ability to come up with compromisation with the hospitals, but it depends on the availability of resources in that hospital and the availability of beds in other hospitals. You've started an ethics committee. Is our end of life cases uh, the preponderance of the kinds of cases that you get, or if not, what, what would characterize the sorts of cases that make their way to your ethics committee? Well, the ethics committee actually received many cases, different cases, but we have a habit of developing policy and procedures whenever we have uh, a good num number of cases. So if we decide, if we find that there, are, for, for example, we have found that, that uh, end of life care is very uh, common decision that uh, intensivist and physician needs to take. So we developed a policy and procedures, detailed policy and procedures, based on the Islamic bioethics uh, rulings by the Mufti and the scholars, and based on the Saudi uh, Society of Intensive Care Unit. Mm -hmm. Intensive care, in intensivist. intensivist. So at the end, we develop the policy and procedures, so physician, and we, we educate physicians. So at the end of the day, physicians are able to take the decision with the family. If they have trouble, then they will uh, consult the ethics committee or consult me personally, and I will try to help in finding, uh, to facilitate and alleviate if there is anything can be alleviated and facilitated to find the, to, to, to reach the final decision. I'm just curious how m much, how, to what extent end of life cases are conflictual in Saudi Arabia. If you were going to rank the kinds of cases in terms of frequency of what comes up on American ethics committees, I would say that end-of-life care, of course, there's many types of ethics conflicts, but that conflicts regarding the use or foregoing of life-sustaining treatments is probably number one or right up near the top. Where would you rank that in, in, in Saudi culture? How often are there conflicts around that? You are right. I have noticed that when, I were, when I'm attending the ethics committee meetings. Here. Here in Mass General Hospital. And so it's, uh, it's the most common cases. So as I said, in, in, our, uh, in our country, we have a clear cut policy and procedures regarding the end of life care based on the fatwa or the religious uh, rulings. But I'm asking you about the incidence of the conflict around that. Like well, how often do family members um, say, no, that's not how we want to proceed. And so it ends up as something that has to be discussed at the ethics committee. Well, it depends on the, on the uh, communication skills of the treating teams. Yeah and also depending on the uh, family uh, members. So uh, most of the time, uh, if the family is very well, uh, you know, they come together and the physicians, they know the physician because he's, he's or she is taking care of their mother or father for a long time. So uh, it's rarely to have such uh, It's conflict. rare, is that what you said? Uh, it's rare? As far as, as, mm -hmm. I, as I know, okay. it's not common. Uh, so that's a difference. It's not common to be resolved but maybe there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, conflict between the treating team and the, the patient's family. But eventually it will, it will be resolved with the discussion. And actually, most uh, Muslims, when they are uh, confronted with the Muslim scholar's opinion and the uh, mm -hmm. Quran and the Hadith mm -hmm. uh, sayings of Prophet, Prophet of the Quran phrases, they are always, you know, uh, accept that, and uh, this is very helpful in discussing the end of life care with families. Even though the scholars differ, differ on how they interpret things, well, the fact that there is an authority there makes it less conflictual. Yeah, but we are lucky because this issue has a uh, major majority of scholars agrees on the process of the end of life care. On the right to refuse. On the right to refuse, and the, life to, to withdraw. the right to draw, withdraw or withhold the treatment. Okay, that's great to know. Well, we've just been talking about differences and similarities in the context of end-of-life decision-making. 
you know that um, Harvard and the Hastings Center co-sponsored a conference recently on, um, we called it uh, the ethics of making babies on reproductive ethics. And I'm wondering in that domain, um, how Muslim perspectives and Western secular perspectives on, on the range of issues related to reproduction um, stand up? Well, um, first of all, making babies, this expression may be problematic for some Muslims because they believe that God is, is the one who makes babies. Uh, but I'll take it as a metaphor. So I accept <laughs> okay, it as a metaphor. Okay. So, uh, and yes, there is a difference. There are differences and there are similarities between Islamic bioethics and Western secular bioethics in, in, uh, in the reproductive, in the reproductive area. area. For example, uh, IVF in, uh, in vitro fertilization, mm -hmm. it's f widely practiced in Muslim countries because Islam encouraged Muslims to treat fertility because kids in Islam is a source of blessing in this life and the life after. So Muslims actually not only permis permitted to, to seek a treatment or cure for fertil infertility, but they are encouraged. So IVF is very wide. And the third issue is the surrogacy issue. As you know, the IVF is encouraged in Islam, but sometimes the woman cannot uh, uh, carry the baby. So they look for a third, or the, the, they look for the third party, second, second woman who is going to carry the baby for nine months gave birth and then leave the baby with the couples and walk away. The, those who are against the surrogacy believe that this is unfair for the woman and at the same time... For the surrogate. For the surrogate. And at the same time, the, the mother in, 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 in Islamic uh, literature and culture and, and sources is known as Walida. So Walida is the mother. Walada is giving birth. So actually, the uh, mother who gave birth is a walida, is a mother. So in this case, how come you deprive her of her rights to be a mother? But at the same time, the eggs and the sperm are coming from the couples. Mm -hmm. So who's going to be the mother? And this is a dilemma, and this is actually will violate the higher principle or higher objective of protecting uh, a lineage or protecting uh, lineage or uh, protecting uh, uh, offsprings. So to avoid violating the higher principle of protecting li lineage, then this is prohibited. You've also talked about it, though, as, as violating the rights of the surrogate mother, yes, which is course. a different issue than the lineage yeah. issue. Are both issues discussed? Both issues are discussed, and as, as part of the uh, process of developing discussion in bio Islamic bioethics, there is more than uh, aspect to be discussed. One of them is the right of that woman. And actually, uh, what will be her position in the family? Is she going to be a mother or not? And is she going to be allowed to see that po po baby or not? What's the relation of that baby to her? So this kind of issue uh, led to the prohibition of surrogacy in Islam. So it, it's, it's prohibited worldwide? Well, uh, if we talk about Muslim country, there is a, a kind of very minor uh, scholar, minority opinion of, of some scholars, uh, in fact one scholar, who supported the, uh, the surrogacy and uh, this scholar was actually uh, opposed by uh, some scholar from his school of thought. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was interesting because the consensus was built by all schools of thoughts. That's uh, and and yet he was disagreed. And yet he disagreed only by someone inside his particular absolutely. perspective. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So those are scholarly commentaries and moral commentaries. What's the state of the law in Muslim countries? Is there, is there something consistent from Muslim country to Muslim country legally? That is a very important question. Thank you for asking this, Meli, because the fatwa uh, is technically non-binding religious opinion. But the fatwa takes, uh, the, the fatwa is needed sometimes in a, a Muslim country who is uh, applying Islam, like Saudi Arabia, they will base the law on the fatwa. Now, in our time, 
the fatwa is coming from a collective fatwa, collective scholars. It's not anymore one scholar or two scholars. So the fatwa, despite the fact that it is non-binding, now it, it gained more strength than before. So probably the fatwa of the councils, for example, we have in Saudi Arabia uh, three councils. One council is the Saudi Council for Supreme Scholars, but we have two important councils in Saudi Arabia. One represent all Muslim countries, that is the International Fiqh Academy. The other one represent the uh, Muslim scholars of all Muslim countries, of most Muslim countries, that is the Muslim League. Muslim League is non-governmental. The, uh, the other council is governmental. And both of them, they are very active in this issue. Both of them, cons they, cons uh, they build a consensus against surrogacy. They did? They did. And is that now reflected in law? That is reflected in law in most uh, country in, 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 our, uh, in the Muslim world. Interesting. So we've talked about end of life care and we've talked about reproductive ethics. Are there any other domains that where you think it's interesting to compare or contrast secular and Muslim bioethics? Well, the, the, there are many areas uh, that were uh, discussed in the Islamic bioethics. Let's take, for example, the organ transplantation. Oh, okay. This is one of the early uh, issues that, were, that was discussed among Muslim scholars and physicians. And uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, very early the scholars uh, produce a fatwa that permit organ transplantation. And uh, uh, I think I remember that in, in the early 90s, the first uh, heart transplantation was done. Uh, it is based on the uh, concept of preserving or protecting life. So as, as we all know in the, in the verse in the Quran that says, if, if one saves one life, it's like if he saves the whole humanity. So this is an, another one, the organ transplantation is a very important uh, field uh, in which Islamic bioethics uh, c contribute to the discussion of bioethics in the world. Is there both donation after cardiac death as well as donation after brain death in Saudi Arabia? That's an interesting question. There are actually uh, controversy on this issue because of the different fatwa. One fatwa stated that uh, the organs can be uh, taken from the patient when the physicians decided that the patient is a brain death case, while the other fatwa said they can't take it until the patient uh, until they stop the life-supporting machines and the patient uh, come to death. So the, the announcement of death is after the stopping the, uh, stopping the, uh, the, the uh, life-saving machine. So in this case, as we know, the only organ that can be uh, transplanted or can be used is the kidney, while in the other case, many organs can be used because uh, they, they, it, it's perfused, mm -hmm. so there is no ischemia on that, in that case. And this is actually is a kind of uh, a hot debate right now, and there, there is revisiting uh, discussion, and hopefully they will reach uh, to the decision that will help I promote. Think, uh, I think that even with donation after cardiac death, we can use other organs besides kidneys because we begin that process very quickly, within a few minutes yeah. of cessation. Okay, do you have any other, the, I think the sort of the last questions I wanted to ask you have to do with advice you might have for Western physicians who are here in the States caring for patients, Muslim patients and their families. Is there anything you think would help create greater sensitivity or responsiveness to clinical decision making for those patients or for their health that, that Western physicians should keep in mind? Well, I think the Western physicians uh, have been involved in, in uh, discussing Islamic bioethics uh, in, in the last few years. I have come across many articles published in the uh, United States about Muslims patient and their needs. In fact, in 2010, the news, the New York Times published an article. It's entitled The Needs for Muslim Patients. And they cited, oh. yeah, they cited an article, a reflection by one of the um, uh, one of the emergency medicine physicians in, in New York, and uh, he wrote a reflection on a case that was published in the Journal of American Academy of Emergency Medicine. And then he actually elaborated more on it and published it in the Journal of Medical Ethics. And it's about understanding the needs of a patient, a female Muslim patient, uh, 
understanding her needs for modesty, understanding her needs for uh, being uh, respected and not exposed, her dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, we don't understand why she took that decision, but when we become more aware of her background, her beliefs, uh, her rituals, etc., we will be, uh, let's say that, more sensitive uh, towards that issue. And we can find answers to their questions. And it's not necessarily to refuse providing them with care, but we can provide the care uh, that is actually culturally sensitive, so to mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. to, that, to that patient. This will help the patient to be engaged in, in the healthcare and in the management of her, pa of her physician. So I, I would like to urge all uh, Muslim and non-Muslim physicians who are taking care of Muslim patients in the United States to read about the topic. And interestingly, many articles, uh, very good articles, were published in nursing journals more than the physician journals. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. yes. And yeah. I, I think this is because nursing profession is built on, on the compassion and the care and the, and the, the spirit of care in, in among nursing you know, population is, is very obvious. And uh, I don't want to compare, but it's very clear that nursing are more understanding when it comes to the special needs of patients. Their professional ethic requires a real attention to patients' yeah. needs and patients' cultural beliefs. And actually, I was not surprised when I, when I came to know that many chairs of ethics committees are nurses. That's true here yeah. in, Boston, yeah, in Boston, for sure, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe this is a, a harder question, but are there any cultural beliefs or um, I don't know, desires or behaviors that Muslim patients might make requests of physicians that maybe physicians would not be willing or desire to comply with? Absolutely. Muslim patients, regardless of their level of observance, because we, we, don't, we, we don't want to assume that all Muslims are observant, but some Muslims who are uh, very religious, very observant, for example, they want to, to, to perform their prayers on time. And uh, if the physician is aware of that, they can arrange a way to, to reschedule the doses or the treatment or so what, whatever, so they cannot violate that, right? On the other hand, sometimes, uh, in, in for example, in fasting, Ramadan, uh, month of Ramadan, if the physician can come to an agreement with the patient on a special rearrangement of the of the treatment, they can the patient they can fast Ramadan and take their medication at night, for example, without understanding that needs, without asking the patient to to open up and to to tell to say what what she wants, we will not be able to understand her her needs. So that is very important. Another issue, maybe it's not common here, but in in our country. Uh, the visitors who comes to visit the patient, who come to visit the patient, sometimes are overwhelming, and people cannot understand in the Western country why. Because the family and the friends and and the neighbors, they are like a like a one family. So this is maybe disturbing the nursing or the physicians. So this is need to be an understood, and especially uh, when when the patient comes to to the United States with a difference in the culture and and uh, beliefs. I'd like you to just reflect a little bit. You've been here now several months, and I know that you've been embedded, so to speak, inside several of our major hospitals, participating and observing on ethics committees and ethics consults, maybe even on an IRB. I'm not sure. Yeah. But you've had a lot of um, wonderful walking around <laughs> and, and uh, being integrated into the health systems of, of Boston. Um, what surprised you the most as you've observed us? You know, Millie, one of the, one of the fundamental issues that surprised me is the issue of autonomy. Before coming to the United States and uh, uh, through my readings in the, you know, the different books, Western Secular Bioethics, I had the, uh, the, the uh, perception of absolute autonomy. Uh, autonomy. Uh, 
But when I came here, I found that, that it's not that absolute that I, ha I have imagined. It, ac it actually have more kind of context-oriented autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, in the discussion with the patient and the family uh, here, so family are involved. It's not like I imagined. The different views about what type of autonomy we want or, or, or what type of autonomy the patient needs. The issue of uh, the difference between respecting person and autonomy. So respecting pers person is actually wider than autonomy. So sometimes the autonomy is not to just uh, overwhelm the patient with information and leaving the patient to decide and leading the patient to have an anxiety about that, but actually to uh, provide him with an autonomy, not to impose an autom autonomy on it. So this is actually one of the uh, aha moment in, in this in this yes. uh, fellowship. Well, we've tended many, uh, we've we've focused so much on autonomy as the way to implement respect for persons that sometimes it's been overlearned yes. and or there's been a very thin notion of autonomy and a knee-jerk response to kind of just give information to patients and say okay you decide you're autonomous and I don't think that's at all what's meant as you say it's a much deeper it's much deeper, uh, yeah. uh, understanding of the importance of respecting a person and their values but that doesn't mean throwing information and saying you decide it means helping and offering recommendations and shepherding it's a it's a much more of a give and take and a shared decision making model so i'm glad that you I, i'm glad that coming in 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 person uh, was a qualifier for what you were reading about yeah that that was actually and actually the 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 physician role here uh, i don't want to say that but probably there are there is some compromisation or some of restriction on physician autonomy. Actually, the physician uh, sometimes is just uh, an information provider. But in my country, in the, actually in the literature, in the Islamic literature, in the Islamic heritage, in the Islamic history, physician uh, is seen as a wise mm -hmm. guide. Mm -hmm. So it's not only an information provider, uh, uh, he, he or she, is expected to guide the patient, to give the advices whenever needed, uh, being sensitive, uh, being uh, sensitive in giving advices. Of course, the patient has has the autonomy and has to, to decide. But the physician uh, has more uh, things to do than to watch and to wait for the answer from the from the patient. Yes, offering guidance. Offering guidance. Very important. Yeah. yeah. So what are you planning to do when you complete your year with us um, this later this spring and you go back to Saudi Arabia? How do you imagine using your experiences here? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the, for the opportunity. And I learned a lot. And I hope when I go back to Saudi Arabia, I will be able to contribute to the uh, ongoing discussion and uh, activities on bioethics in Saudi Arabia. Actually, bioethics in Saudi Arabia started a long time ago, in the early 80s. If we can go back, if you, if you talk about public health ethics, we can talk about the 30s, the first oh. time published the policy and procedures for quarantine and for epidemics was in the, in the early 30s in Saudi Arabia. So uh, in the early 80s, uh, physicians and doctors and scholars started to meet and discuss issue about bioethics. And actually, uh, most our, of our university uh, established courses in the undergraduate mm -hmm. in the medical schools in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the research ethics committees are well established in Saudi Arabia. The National Bioethics Committee makes it mandatory. They, they published the law in 2000. And, uh, uh, 10 and they revise it two or three times but the clinical ethics committee is the one that needs to be uh, developed uh, so far uh, it's a kind of uh, it depends on the hospital mm -hmm. depends on the people so what I would like to do and I hope I can have the power and the support to do it is to establish a clinical ethics committee or clinical ethics consultation service in my hospital and to be a model for the rest of the kingdom. 
Well, I wish you lots of luck, and I have every reason to believe this is going to be very successful. Thank you very much. Thank Mary. you. Thank you. It's been wonderful having you in the fellowship this year. Thank you. All of us have learned so much. You bring so much to our to our sessions. It's been a, it's been a thrill, and we've also been very happy that we've been able to find ways for you to become integrated into the Harvard affiliated hospitals. I know that you are sitting on ethics committees, observing uh, research ethics committees, case consultation, so you've really become a member of our community. We're going to be sad to see you go, but I know that you're going to be doing incredible things when you go back to Saudi Arabia. Thank and you. They're, gonna be ve they're going to be very lucky to have you, so Thank as you. we have been. Thank you very much, Melia. I have enjoyed being here and hope to come back again and again, and uh, we'll be always uh, ready to contribute to the uh, discussion in bioethics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary, for having me. I'd like to encourage you to check out our online journal, which you can find on our website. And there you will also see many uh, other things that the Center for Bioethics here at Harvard is, is doing, our master's program, our fellowship program, our conferences. And I hope that you will engage again on the next issue of this journal. Thank you.